Welcome to Politics and Why with Sky Behind the Curtain, where we are speaking with Chris Coffey, who was just named the new co-CEO of Tusk Strategies, which was founded by Bradley Tusk, who is known as one of the early investors in Uber and served as their first political advisor. But I'm here with Chris now, who has served in New York City government and on several major political campaigns. So congratulations on your new promotion as co-CEO. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Sky. I appreciate it. Yeah, so of course, tell us your story really from the beginning, how you first got involved and how you worked your way up. I don't know where to start. I, my first campaign was I was eight years old and my mom was Ed Koch's chief of staff. She was Ed Koch's chief of staff for 12 years. And on election day in 1989, she took me out because we didn't have school that day. And I stood in the corner and passed out leaflets for Ed Koch. Um, and he lost, sadly. Um, but it was, it was time. It was time. And I, I knew from that, you know, I knew always that I wanted to get into city politics, that like being in, in the mayor's office, being around the mayor was was a fun and amazing thing. People always said, like, why don't you go to Washington? And I just didn't care. I mean, I did. I spent a couple of years, you know, uh, in and around the White House and just not not for me. So uh, when Mike Bloomberg was running for mayor in 2001, um, I had interned every year for his company and they needed someone to like keep him on schedule and get his coffee and, you know, make sure everything was going okay. And I uh, was, was uniquely suited in that I'd worked for him before. And so uh, did that. He was supposed to lose and I was going to go back to DC and he won. And it was right after 9-11. And I knew that, um, you know, I had this once in a lifetime opportunity to be with a new mayor who was supposed to lose and who had come from behind. Uh, and I ended up doing 11 years at City Hall or for his campaigns uh, before coming to Tusk in 2012. Yeah. And since you've been at Tusk now, speaking of mayoral campaigns, you recently co-managed the Andrew Yang campaign and everyone had high hopes for him. So now I know he's starting his new political party. So I wonder if you're still involved with him. I was super involved in his run for mayor, obviously, and was proud of the race that we ran. Um, but I am a Democrat, proud, proud Democrat, uh, and I'm not involved in the board party. Um, but, uh, but I had a great time uh, running his campaign. I'm now finally able to sort of talk about it. It took me like a, a good month or six weeks to feel like, um, you know, I didn't have PTSD. Uh, but now I feel better about it. So, um, you know, Eric ran a great race. Eric Adams ran a great race. Uh, he talked about crime and he, he did it in a way that was really compelling for people in a moment where we needed that and it worked. And, you know, to the prize goes, the, to the spoils go the prize, whatever the expression is. Yeah, I mean, not to be too triggering and to bring back any PTSD, but what do you think if there's one thing you had to say about Andrew Yang that he didn't do correctly or that he could have done differently? Well, I don't blame this on him. I mean, he, he, he's a very, very smart, very, very smart, very charismatic person who decided to run for mayor in December of an election year, the next year, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, when Mike Bloomberg ran for mayor, A, he had spent years around the infrastructure. And then he also did a year or two of what I think they called like mayor school, where he would every week meet with a different expert or every day meet with a different expert and really kind of bone up on the city budget and Rikers and all those things. Andrew just didn't have the time to do that. I, I actually think um, from where he started off, um, to where he got, it was a very impressive, he did hundreds of like over a hundred Zoom forums mm -hmm. where he was taught, you know, very in the weeds on housing policy and on, and did it really, really well. Now, there were a couple of notable moments where he did not know what 50A meant mm -hmm. or did not know what, um, how big the city MTA's capital budget was. Right. Um, and so people, you know, jumped on that and, you know, it is what it is, but the idea that like, oh, if he had only studied a little bit more, um, you know, he, I think he did a pretty good job of, of being, uh, of, of knowing a lot of this stuff. Uh, and people picked Eric Adams. Yeah. I mean, what, to what you said, your point, you got to be in and around and about, you know, so to really build that big foundation. So now as someone as tapped into New York City government and politics as you are, what's the next big trend or company, any insights you have for New York City as we move forward out of the pandemic? Oh, I don't know. Next big trend. I mean, I think what you're seeing in city, I think you've got this mayor's race, which is like a foregone conclusion. And then there'll be a speaker's race, which is, which is super important for folks in and around city government, right? 
the laws are passed by the city council. The speaker is picked by 51 members of the city council. And um, as soon as the mayor's race ends next week, there's going to be a race to, uh, to, to pick a new uh, speaker. And I do think for folks that care a lot about, you know, are there, are there too many cops? Do we need more cops? Do we want a gifted and talented program? Do we not want a gifted and talented program? Um, the next speaker of the city council is going to be a very, very meaningful person. And unlike the mayor or the governor, it's not picked by um, the people. Right? It's picked by 51 members. It's a very internal facing process. Um, and it's going to play out really starting next week, you know, through December 15th or December 20th. And, um, you know, that's how we got Chris Quinn. And that's how we got Melissa Marcovrito and Troy Johnson and Peter Ballone and all those folks. Yeah. So we'll see. Are you going to be at Somos where these decisions are potentially made? So A, I don't believe that Somos, like I think, sure, there's great conversations that happen at Somos and Somos is a super important place thing. Um, but I don't think the speaker's race is going to get solved until the end of December. You're not going to, I just don't think you can have a speaker like designate waiting for seven or eight weeks. I am going to be at Somos though. Um, yeah, I'll see you yeah. there. I will see you there and I'm looking forward to going. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to going too. I know it'll be my first time. So um, my first time too. Oh, great. I never, I know we can have a first time club if you want. Like I would okay. do, I would have, I would have a first time club with you. Okay, let's do it. Want. Yes, yeah. definitely. <laughs> well, I'll see you there. It's a good way to end it, but you know, we didn't get to anything personal. I know you have two kids of your own and, and there's other things that you may want to share with us. So is there anything else you'd I'm like to have to come back? I'm gonna have to come back. That's all. I'll just okay. come back. Okay, we'll do it again. Maybe we'll film an episode live from Somos. Yes, first time club episode, first episode club. Yep. Okay, Chris Coffee, congratulations on being co CEO of Tusk, and we'll see you at Somos. Thanks for having me.